it truly is, uh, Josiah, and my joy and honor to come and be with you guys. And so the honor is ours, and it's been truly a joy getting to meet and know some of you. Some of you I, are come have come to other conferences or places we've been, and so I've gotten to know you a little bit, and such a joy uh, just to get to know God's people is a real joy. And so uh, I appreciate this may be our last opportunity to come. I don't believe that or what Lenny said, but if it was, we have thoroughly enjoyed ourselves and um, enjoyed the Lord together. That's what's most important, isn't it? So thank you guys. And uh, isn't, isn't Slater just an awesome young man? <laughs> I had to say that to him back there. <laughs> I, uh, I know I shared something with him the other night from the Lord. Uh, but uh, man, Slater, just keep on brother. I know you will, but uh, the Lord's uh, anointing presence is upon you in a powerful way, and I so recognize and appreciate that, and I know the cost that comes with that, to walk in that. So really appreciate you, brother, and all of you guys here. Uh, um, this morning's been filled with God activity in the room, and uh, it's really a, really a for my part, it's a joy to watch that, what the Lord does and things. So maybe we'll get to sharing a little bit of that as we go along. How's that? So, All right, we're going to look at uh, several passages of Scripture. We're going to look firstly at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and then we're going to get to the book of Revelation. I really felt from the Lord, Pastor Lenny, before I came, I was to share some out of the book of Revelation and some specific things, so uh, I wanted to uh, get to that. But the setup for that really is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 here. Verse number 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I won't take the time to look at the whole of this passage, but if you look at titles in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, mine, depending on your Bible, says ministers of a new covenant. I don't know what yours says, but um, you know, I appreciate sometimes the headings they give and just point that out. Context, you have to really read a book, really to read the book to get the context because there are no chapters, no verses in the original. So really to catch the context, number one, you need the Holy Spirit. He inspired this so he knows the right interpretation of it. But also uh, just to, to read and prayerfully read and ask the Holy Spirit um, to give understanding to the scriptures is really, really important, and, and you can really get a context when you read all of it. So uh, verse 12, let's just start there. <clears throat> Having therefore such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not as Moses, who, who used to put a veil over his face that the sons of Israel might not look intently at the end Underline that in your heart for a second. At the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened for until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. And that's true. It doesn't matter whether you're Israel or you're from Tennessee, like myself, the only way to have veils removed is by seeing the Lord. And that's what we're about to read. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Now I want to make a few comments and then we'll move forward in this. This concept of a veil and Paul's being very specific here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The veil that was lying over the people was the veil of that first covenant. 
they had not moved beyond the prophecy that the first covenant was to the person who was the fulfillment of that covenant. That's still true in the church today. Uh, we take Old Testament things and never get to Jesus. I, that just went down like a rat sandwich. It bears repeating. That's exactly what Paul's saying here. If we're not arriving at Christ in the Scriptures, we are completely off base in our assessment, understanding, and interpretation of those Scriptures. Christ is the meaning of the Scriptures. Christ is the great truth that God has given. He, the living Word, takes precedence over the written Word. Because the written word is in time, and the living word is outside of time. The written word is pointing to the living word, and the written word bears testimony of that living word. And that's why the Holy Spirit gave, I love the scriptures, but I, I want to understand those scriptures rightly, don't you? And to really understand scriptures is not an informational dynamic that we're after. Well, I think I know what this means. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit has used every bit of the scriptures, every circumstance, everything written to point to a person. And that person is the eternal word of God himself, Christ. Thank you for your wonderful response. <laughs> Christ is whom the Father has given. Christ is the meaning of the Scriptures, the right interpretation of the Scriptures. Now, the Holy Spirit wants to give us that right interpretation. He wants to lead us, not just to Christ in the salvific experience, He wants to lead us to Christ in the depth of the relationship that God purposed for us as humanity uh, from the very beginning, original intent, in other words. It's that relationship that God is, hey, Jacob, good to see you, brother. Uh, has desired to lead us into. Um, the, the bane of the church right now is what I call a lack of spiritual intelligence. I'm being general in my remarks as I speak to this, but look at everything that's called the church in Western culture. Everything that calls itself the church. How far have we strayed from the person, first of all? And how far have we understood, uh, strayed from the understanding that the scriptures are pointing to this person because this person happens to be the life. And the scriptures could never give us life. The covenant could never give us life. The covenant could only point to the life. And that's, uh, as you know, in the New Testament, when we look at this, uh, that's constantly being said. These scriptures uh, that what Jesus said about it in John chapter 6, you study these scriptures because you think life is in them. These scriptures testify of me. You won't come to me and have life. That's what he says about it. So, so what happened thus was a veil was lying over their hearts or over their understanding. That veil still exists today. And I'm not just talking about in Israel. I'm talking about the church. It is in Israel, but it's also in the church. And it's over the nations. There is a veil or veils. And it is only removed not by just believing in Jesus, but by seeing, beholding. The Lord. That's what's said here. It's one thing just to say, well, I believe. The devils believe and tremble. That's <laughs> what the scripture has to say about it. You believe, so do the devils. Of course they believe, but they don't have believing faith, do they? They're not entrusting themselves unto him. They're in direct antagonistic relationship with God. They're in rebellion and so is most of the world. But my point is veils, the veils being removed. And those veils are removed very clearly here by beholding the Lord. It is by beholding Him or seeing Him, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And let, let me say, let me make a distinction for a moment. There's a distinction between revelations, plural, and the revelation of Jesus Christ that Paul hits very emphatically in the book of Galatians. It was, he said, by the revelation of Jesus Christ in me that separated me 
from my mother's womb. In other words, his first birth identity was completely lost to him at the revealing of Christ in him. And so ours needs to be lost. Our citizenship is not of this earth. It is of heaven. All of us. We who are in this room this morning, it does not matter your color. It does not matter your background. It doesn't matter who our moms and dads were or weren't. We are brothers and sisters by the life, one life that is in us, Christ, our life. I thought it would get a better response than that out of that. So we, see, we're still figuring on our first birth identity. Christ separates us from our first birth identity. Can you say, thank the Lord for that? Because your first birth identity is an antagonistic relationship against God and hell will be your home. That's how serious it is. You were born a sinner. You're not a sinner because you sin. You were born into it. You are by nature an object of wrath and God aims to judge you. Let me be very, very clear with you. When you were born, when you came into this planet, you were already by nature an object of wrath. I'm quoting Ephesians chapter 2. Man's problem is not just sin. Man's problem is the sin nature that was passed to us from, our, from our first, the first two, Adam and his wife. And so the whole race is under the dominion of the sin nature. You know the first word your baby's going to learn is no. <laughs> Isn't that true? Stop that. Stop it. <laughs> kind of works like that, doesn't it? Rebellion's shut up and bound up in the heart. Even in the children. We can see it. So uh, we're born with this issue. See, people think, man, if I could just stop sinning, I'd be all right. That's what the sinners are thinking out there. If I could just stop this sin. No, you have to be born again. You have to have an entire, you have to be jacked up in an entirely other than nature run inside of you. Christ to life. That is the only solution. There is no hope in getting freed from sins, plural. There's only hope in having an entirely new life that is freedom from the very nature of sin. You hear what I said? Christ in you is freedom from the very nature of sin. Once God deals, that's the actual aid to the root. Once God deals with the nature of sin, you're no longer a sinner. Anyway, that's, this isn't even the message. I'm just trying to get to it, but I'm I just trying to be. See, where the church has come to, we're trying to, we're picketing, we're doing this. We're trying to deal with sins of our nation. The problem with our nation is the sin nature. And folks, we're the ones who should know the truth of Christ and the reality of Christ that can truly help them. See, people don't like this. They're saying, don't tell me I'm a sinner. I'm going to heaven. Not without Jesus, you're not. I'm being blunt, but I'm being truthful. What, do you want me to lie to you? Would you rather hear a lie or hear the truth? Which one is going to help you, lying to you or telling you the truth? Our nation is so filled with lies now and no absolutes, and isn't that true? No understanding of the scriptures anymore, and there's absolutes in the scripture. What he says to Israel, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's what he said to the nation of Israel, and they had the scriptures, and they had the fathers, and they had the testimony of God. Did they not? See, we're, I can't hit this strong enough. We are, we've made things into a huge curve. I tell you, it's a straight path. That's what the scripture says about it. Straight, narrow. Anyway. Man, Eugene, how do we get there? <laughs> how do I get us there, brother? But here we are. Here we are needing to hear again the gospel of our salvation, which is Christ, rather than the gospel of America, which is not the gospel of God. It's a different gospel. And that's what, you know, 
You think there's not strong language? Read the book of Galatians again. You know what Paul had to say about those who were preaching another gospel? Let them be put to death. Let them be cursed. The word there is anathema, death. Let death come upon them. Why? Because you're leading people astray. You're not just responsible for yourself when you're preaching another gospel. You're responsible for all your hearers. Their blood will be on your hands every time. When you stand before God as a believer, their blood is going to cry out against you. I've been to that place and watched people go through that judgment. My own father watched him weep uncontrollably because everything within him wanted to hear God say to him, well done. He could not say it to him. Everything my father had ever done in his life was burned up right in front of his eyes. He wept bitterly and uncontrollably before the Lord. I was watching. I wept with him. That's the real issue, folks. Nobody wants to talk about it. We're going to stand before the Lord. We're going to be accountable for everything you've done in your body. Did you hear what I just said? Everything you've done in your body, you will be accountable for if you've not repented. Turned. So, man, this is hard. It's the truth. I'm not going to lie. I have to stand before the Lord like you. It's true of me. It's not just true of you guys. It's true of me. It begins with the messenger. The messenger better be the message. Better be living the message, not living a lie, not living a double standard, not half-hearted, but wholeheartedly after the Lord. Isn't that true? The problem with most of the pulpits, when you agree, Pastor Lenny, is there's a double standard in the pulpit. We're giving a message, but we're not messengers. God, give us the fire of God shut up in our bones to purify a people completely and wholeheartedly under the Lord. God, give us a people when they speak the truth. It is the truth. Christ and Christ alone. God, give us a people whose life is backing up what they're saying. I offer us hope for our nation. It does not lie in any gimmick. It lies in a people taking hold of the horns of the altar. A repentant people who take hold of God for the sake of our nation. Amen. Well, that's all 2 Corinthians. Got the baby crying. This is not untypical. <laughs> I feel about like the baby. I want to cry too. <laughs> Vernon, come on up now. Bring the baby. Amen. Why don't we stand? Thank you. Praise God. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your service. Um, my name is Rachel Powers, and this is Vernon Lewis, my dad. You've probably seen him around. This is my daughter, Jordan, my husband, Eric, and my family. <laughs> he's right. He's known us. He's known me since I was born, um, Pastor Barbara, and he ministered my husband and I when we got married and before our daughter was born. He blessed our daughter as well. Um, in October of last year, we found out that my daughter, Jordan, she was eight at the time, she's nine now, praise God, um, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And uh, so she's been through radiation and chemo, and we've been believing God for her healing and standing by faith 
for <laughs> you. I think I have strength. <laughs> If you all would just pray with me right now for strength in the spirit. I welcome the Holy Spirit into this place right now. In Jesus' name. We know God is able and God is willing, and that's all we stand on. That's all we stand on. And we just came today because she's still going through. We're still standing in faith. She's still going through, and we know that God is able and God is willing. And we wanted to bring her, as my dad eloquently put it, it's like the woman with the issue of blood. We came to touch the hem of God, of Jesus' garment. We know that this is a praying church, and we know that you have ministers here who are praying and interceding, and people all over the world have been interceding and holding us up in prayer, and we appreciate it, and we know it's working because we know that prayer works. So that's why we're here today. Thank you, sweetie. Can we pray right now? Is that good? All right, we're going to gather around her and pray for all you guys. You know, I'm going to start. I want to rebuke the devourer. The scheme of the enemy to fail. And so, Lord, we loose her from the devourer's attempt to steal, kill, destroy. Now release life, Holy Spirit, that completely burns up this tumor. Burn it up, Holy Spirit, with your life. Burn up this tumor with your life. Let your life now come, Holy Spirit, your life. Your resurrection power, Jesus. Your resurrection life, Lord Jesus. Burn the tumor up. Burn it up. Remove it completely. Rebuke the devourer as well. We're not unaware of the schemes of the enemy. Remove that from this little girl. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, Lord, we ask for the release and the power of your presence. More than healing, we ask for that miracle, that miracle of God, the transforming power of God upon her now. Life, life, wholeness, be made whole. name of the Lord Jesus for the entire family Lord strength for them strength for the family Lord and your angels charge concerning them Lord to lift them up lest they dash their foot against the stone and bear them out Lord your strength to them your strength to them your confidence to them Lord now in the name of the Lord we rebuke and bind the enemy in his power, his attempts, his schemes, his purposes. And we simply, Lord, ask now for the loosing off of her now, the loosing off of her of those purposes. Her now completely, completely bound to your eternal purpose, Lord in your plan for her heart and her life, her future. You are her future, Lord. You are that. Do it now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Do it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Do it, Lord, now, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do it. Tumor disappear. Be burned up. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. joy, huh? Just to stand in the gap for such a time as this. My friends, I'm expecting a miracle, aren't you? I really am. I'm saying that frivolously. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, let's look a little bit at the uh, book of Revelation. I want us to uh, go to chapter 1. I love the book of Revelation. So many things have been written about it, rightly so. <clears throat> so many interpretations have come forth concerning the book. I don't know how right that is, but it's true nonetheless. My objective is not to look at interpretations of the book of Revelation this morning. My objective is to look at what we know for certain uh, without, and is without the need of interpretation. So we're looking in chapter 1. You know, in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees the Lord and um, in beholding the Lord, he is wrecked. And he is reckoned for the rest of his life. And uh, like what we read there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, this, this whole dynamic of beholding the Lord, I can't overstress the importance of that. And not just seeing him with our eyes, though that's fine and, and uh, a part of it as well. But there's something even deeper, if you can hear what I'm trying to say to you, there's something even deeper than is needed with just these eyes. The revelation that Paul was talking about in Galatians of, was of a more an internal matter to where he, what was revealed of Christ, was Christ his life within. 
Christ, his very being. It was at such a depth that that revelation separated him from his first birth identity, from his very, his mother's womb, which was his first birth identity. So that's not meant to be a mystery, but it is clearly New Testament reality that what made the difference in the men and women of God was really not outward stimulus, firstly. It was internal revelation of the person of the Son of God within them. Now, as we look in the book of Revelation chapter 1 here, we're going to see another unveiling go on uh, with the Apostle John concerning Christ. So I want us to look at that for just a second. <clears throat> let's look at uh, particularly, well, let's just start in verse 12 and uh, read uh, from there. And I turn to see the voice that was speaking with me. Now, just a quick note of this. You'll find this issue very, very important in the scriptures. If you remember, Moses turned aside to the burning bush. This turning is very important. Sometimes there's outward stimuli, let me say it this way, that brings us, is meant to at least, brings us into a spiritual experience. Tokens, if you will whose design, if we turn, is to draw us in. If Moses had not turned aside, then the burning bush would not have happened then. God would have got him later, but it wouldn't have happened right then. John hears the voice, but then turns to see. And in the Spirit, let me say this to you, we're dealing with our five senses and their need to be trained. I'm saying this to you. If you have five natural senses, you certainly have five spiritual ones that are of the Spirit. So that you can see the Lord without natural eyes. These are not necessary to see the Lord. Now the Satanists and witches are all over this reality in an evil way. But they've done nothing but counterfeit and steal it from what we can clearly read in the scriptures. When men and women whose spirits had been awakened by the Lord himself coming within them, their spiritual eyes are what Paul's going to call in Ephesians chapter 1, the eyes of their heart. We're able to see. Okay? So I'm not doing a whole teaching on this. I'm barely touching it. But I'm saying this, that you could be completely blind and still see the Lord. Completely deaf and hear the Lord. He does not need, he who created the ear doesn't need the ear to speak. <laughs> he who created the eye doesn't need the eye to show you himself. Anybody here practically deaf? Anybody? Practically deaf? Okay. Can you hear the Lord? <laughs> Do what? Can you hear the Lord? Yes. So see, hearing the Lord's not a matter of just having an ear. And what the book of Revelation says in chapter 2 and 3, the church, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. But you know he's not just talking about natural ears because he says he who has an ear that's the natural, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So having a natural ear doesn't ensure our hearing of the Lord. I'm saying this to you, God is a spirit. Guess where he'll come to? Your spirit. Every time. If he can. If not, he'll break into the outward. Did you hear what I just said? We're priding ourselves on his breaking into the outward. He seldom does it. He'll come to your spirit because he is a spirit. Is that helpful? Amen. Or I'm just trying to help us to understand something. This thing of seeing in the spirit should not be a mystery. 
It should be for all of us, whatever capacity, it should be what we can do. We can see him from here where our spirit is. If you can feel his presence, how many of you have ever felt the presence of the Lord? What did feeling his presence mean? Does that mean that he's present? How many believe that if you feel the presence of the Lord, that means he's present? If he's present, you should be able to see him. Make all the excuses you want to right now. As long as you make those excuses, you'll never see him. (laughs) Ever. Because he breaks into the outward. But many times when the Lord breaks into the outward with me, I'll immediately go inward in the spirit because I'll see it more clearly, more detailed, more fully. I do it regularly so that I can fully see, fully hear what's going on. And I've had the Lord appear directly in front of me, open-eyed, numbers of times, but I'll always turn inward because he happens to live in me. Anyway, let's go on. So John turns, he hears the voice, then he turns and he sees the voice that was speaking with him. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the seven of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet, girded across his breast with a golden girdle, and his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. I want to take note of that. John's seeing of the Lord. In this revelation of Jesus, Christ has eyes that are flame of fire. Now, that's noteworthy to take note of because it's a specific revelation of who he is. And in this revelation, we're going to see aspects of the Lord that we may not want to see, such as what he sees here, his eyes are flame of fire. That means this, that God the Son is in a certain mode of operation. Let's go on, verse 15. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in the furnace. And his voice was the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Take note of that. Out of his mouth is coming a sharp two-edged sword. That's that mode of operation. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Now, I've had di- there's different types of appearances of the Lord that has different intents and purposes. Sometimes the, the revelation of the Lord, his appearing, is of a friendship mode. You don't fall down. It's very peaceful, very restful, very enjoyable. I'm doing extremes here. Then there's this other extreme, like what John's describing here. When the Lord appears in this mode, he falls down like a dead man. How many know that's two extremes? (laughs) Not all appearances of the Lord are the same, nor are they meant to be the same. And like the layers of an onion, the appearances of the Lord have deeper and deeper, and deeper, and deeper, and deeper meaning that must be uncovered in our relationship and by revelation with Him. They're never all the same. They're not meant to be the same. He's showing very distinct aspects of Himself to us. Very distinct modes of operation. Isn't that right, Jacob? He's not in the same mode of operation at all times. And and let's say it this way. It's more like seasons of time that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, God from one second to the next. That would misbetray his nature. God's not moved by emotions. Though he is moved 
and loves and can be grieved. So he's moved, but he's not moved by emotions like we are. Wouldn't you agree? Aren't you thankful for that? What if God just decided to go into a temper tantrum and kill everything? He's not like that. But is he a God of wrath? He absolutely is. And can he go into a certain mode of operation that's according to his great nature and that includes judgment and can include wrath? There's a difference between those two things. Judgment is redemptive. Wrath is purely destructive. There's no redemption purpose in it. We've, what it the case of wrath is this. We've moved beyond judgment. We've moved beyond redemptive purposes. We've refused to heed the judgments. We've refused to repent. We've refused to bow our knees. We've refused to turn. And God is incredibly long-suffering. We know that about Him. We know the fruit of the Spirit, which is the fruit of His life nature that comes to us by Christ in us. By the Holy Spirit, that's what we're dealing with. When you deal with the fruit of the Spirit, you're dealing with the eternal nature of the Godhead. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, self-control. And that nature coming to us in our journey, being imparted to us, being better said, coming forth in us along the journey through the, tri the trials and the tests of our life. Yes, without the trials and tests, you cannot be conformed to the image of Christ. Without conflict and battle, you will never be conformed to the image of Christ, ever. These things are not curses upon us. They are the dealings of God with us. It allows Him to go deep within us by the pressure, the pressure of His life, like in any plant, forces the plant to grow. The internal pressure of the life within the plant, forces the branches to grow, forces the fruit to come forth. It is the internal pressure of the life of God within the believer that for forces spiritual growth. And it is through the conflict or resistance battle that it comes about. What is presently there is not spiritually large enough. There must be spiritual enlargement. God is constantly in that mode of spiritual enlargement, and it's an internal matter, firstly, not external. I'm saying this to you. God's not primarily changing us from external stimuli. It is, in, firstly, an internal work of the Holy Spirit, and it deals with the fruit of the Spirit, the divine nature, and us being partakers of Him by beholding and being transformed, by eating and becoming what we eat. Lest you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. How many know how to eat? Well, when we eat of the Lord, guess what? You become that which you are eating. You say, well, I want to be more like the Lord. Partake of Him. Go before Him. Eugene and I have been talking about this the entire weekend. It's a matter of of standing before the Lord. It's a matter of our personal prayer life. And I, I hate to even use the word prayer life. It, it, it's so far removed from what we're really conveying. What not you say, prayer's a good word, but it's become a bad word. It's a biblical word and a good word, but it's come to mean something about just asking God for things rather than a relationship of becoming one with Him. And prayer is an integral part of that relationship. It's communication. But it's more than just communication. When it's, it's an experience. Prayer is meant to be an experience or it's not true prayer. Does that make sense? It's really true. We made prayer into something that was just rote or it's just memorized or it's just things we've, we've grown accustomed to asking for rather than an experience with the Lord of an, an encounter with his life, with his very presence in his person. And prayer, that type of prayer that is relational, that is quite addictive. Why? Because we were made for him. And like water running back down to the sea, 
given the opportunity by the Spirit especially, we will be drawn back to the one who created us. We were made for him. Isn't that true? Well, prayer has so many connotations in this, and there's different types of prayer, and I recognize that. There's the prayer of, and I'm speaking of that primarily right now, praying that is communion-oriented. I mean, it is about intimacy with the Lord. It is more of a beholding, uh, and, and it's more of this kind of thing. It's this love issue. I'm yours and you're mine. I behold you. You do it for me. I long to gaze upon your beauty and behold you as you are. And that type of prayer, communion-based praying, is so important to the inward man. Therein is this internal fire shut up in your buried bone. Well, I just want you. Because he, and then he's coming back, and I want you. I'm telling you that's what goes on in it. It's a love relationship. There's submission prayer. Not my will. Yours be done. It's, anyway, I didn't go into all that. But I, it's important that we understand there's different types of praying. And the importance of that, it's, you know, there's warfare praying. I've been talking quite a bit about that over the past months. It's a necessity, but it doesn't take precedence first. First precedence in this is our own personal relationship of, I'm in love with you, and you're in love with me. And we have to have that solidly there and maintain that regularly. And then warfare praying will go to heights that it never could have reached without that intimacy, without that communion. Isn't that right, Eugene? without the submission prayer, not my will but yours be done. See, there's a divine order in things, and that's all I'm trying to bring out here. And we don't jump just to warfare praying, and our life consists of warfare praying because the enemy's going to eat your lunch. He's going to come to you personally, and here's how he's going to do it. He's going to come against you in condemnation. And it's going to work this way. God doesn't love you anymore. And if you don't have that place of intimacy, and you're just in warfare, you're going to have your lunch eat. There's divine order in it. And that's true congregationally. Congregationally, we should have communion prayer. Don't you agree? Well, we're just gazing on him, Pastor Lenny, loving on him, blessing him, praising him, rejoicing in him, where the weapon of quietness is brought in. You know, quietness is a weapon. Silence is a weapon. I was, uh, it was, wasn't too long ago, I was actually... That could be any time within the last five years. So, <laughs> I was uh, in a situation where the presence of the Lord had come into the meeting very, very powerfully. And uh, why did I tell these stories, Eugene? Get me in trouble. Come very, very powerfully. And, and uh, I was watching in the room. Um, the Lord had appeared in the room. And then the angel over the church had appeared in the room. And I'm watching other, other things are going on. You're not going to believe it, but some of the saints are in the room. Um, and I'm not talking about y'all. <laughs> I'm talking about those who we would say are dead. They're there and um, very, very strong presence of the Lord. So strong that they didn't know what to do. So what they did, which is what we must never do, is did what they knew to do. And that's what we must never do. If the Lord comes among us and disrupts us, take my advice. Don't ever do what you know to. Why would he disrupt you? When you're on holy ground, just take your shoes off. Why can't we just do that? Isn't that right, Jacob? I mean, the worst thing we do, wouldn't you agree, brother, is do what we know to do. What sense does that even make? He's disrupting us because we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> so what happened was, not knowing what to do, you're not going to like what I'm about to tell you. They went into worship. The Lord turned to me with the eyes of fire. He said, they will never go to where I want them to go until they stop this and do what I want them to do. <laughs> he was intense. I'm telling you, when he has eyes of flame... That's an intense mode. It's called the jealousy of God mode. That's what it's called in the heavenlies. Few beings care to see him in that mode because the terror of the Lord is in that mode. And the terror of the Lord is different than the fear of the Lord. I've been under the terror of the Lord several times where the Lord would appear 
And the terror of the Lord was on that encounter. I didn't fall at a cellular level. My body collapsed. And I screamed at the top of my lungs, hoping to die. Say, oh, why would you do that? Don't judge what I'm telling you until you've been there. That's the problem with what goes on. People try to analyze it. Well, I just uh, forget about, I don't care about your opinions and neither does God. And he don't care about mine. Believe you me, if you ever have the encounter, your little opinions will go right out the window. That's the problem we have. Isn't it right? We, I'm sorry. I'm going to be real open with you. We judge what's being said by our, the lack of our experience. I'm telling you, your very breath comes from him. Your cells and the life that's in them, listen to this, answer to him immediately. I've watched it where my cells react before my mind does. I've watched it with the rocks where the Lord, they recognized the Lord. The rocks did. He wasn't kidding when he told them the rocks will cry out if you don't. We think, oh, that's a good saying. He wasn't kidding. You say, well, rocks don't have life in them. That's what you think. They know who their creator is, and they answer to him. So do the planets and the stars. They sing to him. See, we don't believe that because we don't believe the Bible. Everything he's created answers to him. All of it. It's a beautiful thing. Well, anyway, so the terror of the Lord in my body collapsed. And, and uh, I remember one time a specific experience. These things always happen seemingly at 1.30 in the morning. I don't know why it could be during the day. <laughs> 1.30 in the morning, Eugene. And I hear the door of my bedroom pushed open. The door never moved, but I heard it pushed open, watched it push open. It was shut after the experience, but nevertheless, strange, isn't it? And these four beings walk into my bedroom carrying the Ark of the Covenant and the terror of the Lord's on the encounter. And my body goes into immediately shaking uncontrollably in a way that I hate. I'm trying to stop it. I can't stop it. I close my eyes hoping that they'll go away. <laughs> I'm serious. Please leave. I waited about 45 minutes or so, opened my eyes. They were still there. I went back immediately into the shaking uncontrollably at the terror of the Lord on me. I waited an hour and a half and uh, opened my eyes, and they were gone. I'm not going to tell you what I learned out of that, so I'm not sure myself what I learned out of it. No. I think many of these things are to teach us the terror of the Lord. That is the message. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's what Paul said about it. Did you hear that? So we think it's all about love. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It's what uh, the scripture clearly teaches about this. The nations are not going to repent until the terror of the Lord comes. Did y'all know that? We think there's going to be a sweeping revival without the terror of the Lord. There will not be. Scriptures are emphatic. Though kindness is shown, the nations do not learn righteousness. I'm quoting it to you. When judgment comes, the nations learn righteousness. Let me tell you something about our nation. Our nation is not going to see a move of God until the terror of the Lord comes and the judgments of God come. Will not happen. I'm talking about a major move of God. He's already moving, but the, what we're asking for and praying for, and rightly so, is not going to happen, and it is going to happen, but it's going to be a remnant. And get ready for this. In our nation, because of the doctrinal setup of the enemy, which is teaching us that nothing bad is going to happen to you, and it's all going to get better, you know, the, can I expose this for a second? You ready for it? It is the doctrines of demon, and here's the design of it. The design is so that when the things do happen, you'll fall away from your faith. How's that? That is its purpose. And it's been introduced into our nation, and now it's going all to the other nations as well. And so the other, many of the other nations in other parts of the world who's been under massive persecution, martyrdom is a regular experience with many of them. I'm talking about in families, congregations, have been for years. There's been more people murdered this year than any time in history. Did you know that? 
When the ISIS recently captured that city, you know what they were doing in that city? They were going door to door. And for the believers, they were taking their children and beheading them in front of their families. Trying to get them to deny their faith. Murdering the children. See, we don't have a clue. Here's, let me say something to you. But those brothers and sisters will never fall away from the faith. Because of circumstances and difficult times and fear of martyrdom. But it's a setup for us who've had a life of ease. I'm really hitting it, aren't I? A life of ease and we know nothing about what's going on with our brothers and sisters. And there are brothers and sisters. And they are dying by the thousands. They're murdering their children to get them to renounce their faith. And that's only one area. It's all over the world happening. And it's been happening. We're oblivious to it. And we sit over here snug in our doctrines of demons. Oh, I'm going to have everything. And we love our lives. Instead of loving not our lives unto death, we love our lives. And we're being taught by these doctrines of demons to love your life, love the world. I know you don't like it, but let me finish. <laughs> Let's expose it for what it is. This is going to have devastating effect in our nation when the persecution starts. And believe me, it is coming. In many ways, it's already begun. We just haven't got to the murder stage of it yet. But it's all, the persecution is already there. Homeland Security identified that the top, uh, the top uh, form of terrorism in our nation, the top uh, people of terrorists in our nation were, guess who, people who believe that the book of Revelation is true. That's Homeland Security. Isn't that wonderful? That's what's going on in our nation. You're being targeted because of your faith in Christ. And the church sits silent and oblivious to what's going on. Anyway, most people just don't have the guts to stand up and say it, talk about it, refuse to. Well, I'll be targeted. They might kill me. So be it. Make my day. You say, man, do you really believe they can murder you? I'm telling you, you, you don't want to hear what I'm about to tell you. There's murder squads. We just don't talk about them. We should talk about them. Murder squads specifically designed to murder those who are considered enemies of the state. Well, let's become us. What was it recently? China released, uh, this was beautiful. China released, they recognize this. Have you heard about it, Eugene? China released that the best citizens in their nations were Christians. So they're asking for all this literature, Christian literature, so they can put it into their education system. We're kicking it out, so we got plenty. <laughs> Isn't that right, Eugene? We're getting rid of it. So we can send it over there to a communist nation who's recognized that the better citizens are believers. They're most productive citizens in their country. You know, the story goes like this. In 1949, when communism came into China, here's the truth of the story, uh, there was only about 800,000 Christians, so they tell us. I, I had testimony of Chinese, one of the Chinese leaders, which is kind of a misnomer, that what we would call Chinese leaders, there's so many, many of them. But anyway, in 1949, when communism came in, they confiscated all the buildings. They confiscated all the Bibles they could get a hold of. They, they put the leaders in concentration camps. They did everything they could to destroy the church. The church was driven underground. In the next 40 years, from 1949 to 1989, I'll just stop there. In those 40 years, the church in China grew from 800 and something thousand to over 80 million. No Bibles, no buildings, no ability to openly meet in public. And the church grew. See what I'm trying to say? There's a principle I'm trying to point to. We think that a major move of God is coming to our nation without persecution. I'm telling you, you're mistaken. It's coming the other side of the persecution. Well, that went down like a rat sandwich. But uh, So guess what, folks? You're going to stone me for this. I'm not praying that the judgments be withheld. I'm praying, bring them on. 
I'm not kidding you. Because what it's going to produce is an awakening <laughs> and a falling away. Both. Falling away for those who put their hope on doctrines of demons. I'm talking about those within the church now. But for those outside of the church, a fire sweeping them in to the presence of the Lord and them coming to Christ. Is that helpful, hurtful? Oh me, why did you say that? Why remind us? Why are you even talking about this? It's lunchtime. I know it is. but uh, So I'm, I'm trying to get to this. And God help me to get to it. <laughs> so the Lord appears to John, and in that appearance, there's meaning in the appearance by what he sees. There always is. If you see the Lord, take note of this. You want to pay close attention to the details. The details are never random. They're very specific. If he appears with the eyes of fire, it's a certain mode, and you can recognize that mode. I call it the mode of jealousy. It's actually known as that in heaven itself. God is in this jealous mode. It, part of that meaning, that's not all of the meaning, but part of that meaning means this. His bride is being threatened, and he aims to fight. And woe be unto those who put their hands on the bride. Wouldn't you say, Pastor Lenny? Woe be unto those who get in the way of that bride. Woe unto the, be unto those who touch to murder that bride. And they will. The last thing, I mean, you got to have a bad case of the stupids to want to put your hand on the one he aims to marry. That's, you got to have a bad case of the stupids. Wouldn't you agree with that? I mean, look, where are you going to run and hide? And he comes after you. And believe me, he's going to come after them. And if they don't turn, and that's his heart for them, that they turn to him, if they don't turn to him and repent, God help us. So, so I'm pointing these things out. Thus, we come into what's called chapter 2 and 3. There are no chapters. The revelation of Christ comes to John, and that's exactly how, catch this, this revelation of him is exactly how he's about to reveal himself to the church. Look at it in Revelation 2 and 3. Verse 1, chapter 2, To the angel of the church at Ephesus, right, I'm so much in the book of Ephesians nowadays, I have trouble. I'm, I'm, I've, I've uh, been teaching out of that book extensively. Notice this, the, ones who hold, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, say this. So see, the revelation John has is intent, and intentional and purposeful, but not just for John. It's for the church. And this book of Revelation has always been for the church. And until the Lord comes, it shall always be. It's not a simply an historical book. It's not just a futuristic book. It's all of that and more. My greatest concern for the book of Revelation is that we're categorizing the book of Revelation into certain categories and missing the message, missing the person. Here in chapter 1, 2, and 3, the message comes very clearly to the church at Ephesus which I'll say this, in reading the book of Ephesians, that's the most spiritual book of any book in the Bible. I mean it by saying this, it is the most heavenly book of any book in the Bible. There's others that come close to that, such as the book of Daniel, the gospel of John. But this book, Ephesians, is such a heavenly book. Well, it's to that church that Paul, in writing to them, the Spirit of God unveils the Eternals in a way that are unprecedented. God in the book of Ephesians is unveiling in the first three chapters the great revelation of the eternal plan and purpose of God. Before there was time, the eternal mind and thought of God is being unveiled in the book. It's to that church that now, some years later, that now the Spirit of God 
the Lord Jesus himself actually is directing a very specific message to them. And it begins with, I'm the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands, which are representative, the lampstands are representative of the church. I know your deeds, he says. Well, here's what I want to say to you. His warning then comes to the church in verse 5 that unless you repent, isn't that a beautiful word? Because now we have the doctrines of demon floating around in the church that you don't have to repent. When the scriptures clearly show us here in the book of Revelation the need for continuing to repent. If you sin, you need to repent. Corporately, if we sin, if we get away from the will of God, we need to repent. There's no going back without repentance. Or there, let me say it better. There's no going forward without repentance. <laughs> repentance is always going to be necessary. Any doctrine that tells you otherwise than that doesn't, number one, it's a doctrine of demons. And it's not in alignment with the scriptures, which clearly say otherwise. I'm trying to help us. I'm not against something. I'm for Christ in this. And I'm for us getting to where God wants us to get. That's why I'm emphasizing this. That's why I'm contending for a second for the faith. Because I realize something that you realize. We're not going to get there with doctrines of demons. We're going to get there by the truth of Christ. And we're going to need to press on because if you're going to go with the Lord in this, you're going to be in an incredible battle. Let's, let me say this to you. The measure of the battle and conflict that surrounds your life is the measure of the will of God that's in your life. That's a fact. No conflict, you're useless to God. That's strong language, isn't it? No battle, you are completely out of God's will and ineffective. You're no threat. Isn't that strong, Brother Lenny? See, it's the opposite of what we've been taught. Oh, you get to God and everything's going to go smoothly. That's a lie. You get to God and, listen, you are the arch enemy of Satan. And he's going to unleash forces in accordance with your threat. What is that threat? The measure of Christ that's in you. It's absolutely true. Aren't you glad you came this morning? <laughs> See, some of us are under battle. I guess you should get a show of hands. I mean, he's been in battle. You are blessed. I'm not kidding you. You are blessed if you're in battle. You are being used of God in an effective way, in a useful way. That's why you're in battle. Let me debunk something. You're not in battle because God doesn't love you. You're not in battle because God's not with you. You're not necessarily a battle. I have to be careful how I say this because you did something wrong. You could have done something wrong. You got yourself in trouble, but that's not battle. <laughs> but you're not in battle because you did something wrong. You're in battle because something right is happening. We've been lied to. These doctrines bring condemnation on us if we don't know the truth in this matter. Say, man, what, what did I do to get myself in the thick of this? The enemy's coming at me here, 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 here. You are blessed. Besides the fact, I'm under so much battle, I need somebody else to get under battle just to take it off me. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not kidding about being in battle. <laughs> Spread it around a little bit. <laughs> Can't you attack them? <laughs> <laughs> You know Job had to pray something to that effect. He knew his, he knew his number was up as soon as the Lord said, there's no one like you in the east. If I'd have been Job, I'm like, take me home now. <laughs> I know what's coming. Isn't that beautiful? It was because Job was in the will of God that the battle came to him. It was because the apostle Paul was in the will of God that the battle came to him. Listen to this. It was because Daniel was in the will of God that he was carted off to Babylon. We've been lied to big time about these things. We think the objective is to get me into a place where nothing bad happens. A place of zen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having way too much fun with this, but that's not 
the will of God. That's called ineffectiveness. Okay, so the Lord appears and he warns them. He says, look, in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, he said, look, unless you repent, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove the candlestick from you. Unless you repent, you're going to cease to be the church. You know, people don't even believe God will do that. I'll tell you, he'll do that. This is no idle threat to the church at Ephesus. God doesn't make idle threats. In fact, he doesn't make threats in the sense that we're thinking about them. It is a promise that unless you repent, this is what's going to happen. So I'm almost done. Then we move forward. Um, We see in in chapter 2 as well, the church at Pergamum. He says, this is the one, verse 12, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword that's coming out of his mouth there in Revelation chapter 1. So the one who revealed himself to John with this two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, which is a kickback, by the way, to Ezekiel chapter 21 in what's called the Song of the Sword. They sang it. The Song of the Sword. The Sword of the Lord. The Sword of the Lord was coming. And what was coming was Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the nation of Israel, to capture Jerusalem and take the people of Israel into captivity because they had forsaken the Lord. And when they went into captivity, so did the righteous. Did you hear that? Daniel went into captivity with them, and he'd done nothing wrong. Ezekiel went into captivity with them, and he'd done nothing wrong. Can you hear the principle I'm trying to establish here? Because we don't believe it. Well, I'm a believer. Nothing bad is going to happen to me. Whoever told you that lie? Go preach that in Syria right now and see where it gets you. When our brethren are dying by the hundreds. And we don't believe anything bad could happen to us. Is that too straightforward? Why would I say these things? Because to prepare us, to make us ready, we have to know the truth. To go after God has a cost to be his priesthood, which is what he's after, which will answer this day and bring the solution of God into view. Through the priesthood alone, though, believe me when I say that, it is only through the priesthood, those who are before the Lord, who are waging a good warfare in the presence of the Lord, both privately and corporately, are going to stand in this hour. And by standing, I mean standing before the Lord, because you're going to find yourself struck down but not destroyed. Always bearing in your body the marks of Jesus. You're going to find yourself under great persecution and great conflict and great battle. And I want to say this to you. We're not fighting for ourselves. We're fighting for our brethren. We're fighting for the will of God and the great eternal purpose of God. I'm not in this for me, Jacob. I never have been. If I was in it for me, I would not be here. I am in this for your sake and for the sake of the Lamb. There is no other ministry beyond that. True ministry begins with the burden of the Lord. That's where it begins. We must have it in this hour, wouldn't you agree? I happen to believe, and so does God, that you are worth the truth. You're his people. That his church is worth, and believe you me, this stride, the great strides that the church has made through history has come on the backs of men and women who a major component of their life, such a major component, that it was the most noteworthy aspect of their existence was their knees before God in prayer. That's absolutely true. They spend hours and hours and hours and hours and days and nights, and as Eugene said, fasting. Were they doing it for themselves? No, for the sake of the Lamb. The whole Moravian movement was built around that issue. The Lamb is worthy to receive the reward of his sufferings was their motto. So the first two that left out as missionaries, the, the real missionary issue got back on track with the Moravians. I say that because if you study history, you'll find in the first 30 years of the church, they went further and did more in the first 30 years of the church and in 1,900 years since combined. What was the difference? The Holy Spirit, not missionary societies. 
the truth. Blind man can see it. They had the Holy Spirit. And he directed them. Well, the Moravians, what did they do? They sowed themselves into slavery in China in order to take the gospel to the Chinese. The two young men bid their families farewell forever. And as they went on the boat, they said the statement, for the sake of the Lamb. We don't have a clue anymore. We need to have a clue really bad. What has to happen here, Jacob? You know what I mean, brother? What has to happen? God is looking for an elite warrior cast. I'll be point blank with you. He is looking for warriors, not wimps. Priestly warriors. Mighty men and women of David. That's who he's looking for. And he must have them. Their love for their king. Their love for the person. Their loyalty to their king. David happens to be pointed, but I'm talking about the son of David drove them to fight for the kingdom, to fight for that king, and to fight for the will of God for the people. They didn't run ever, ever. You had to kill them. And most of them were unkillable. The Lord whispered it in my ear in a direct encounter, what is needed in this hour, he said, Terry, is an elite warrior caste. He said, they will change the history of the world that you are in. They will be history makers, creating it as they go. I'm weeping before the Lord, crying, asking him to be a part of it. Wake my wife up, who's in the bed beside me, because I'm weeping so hard. Asking, begging the Lord to be a part of it. God has always had such men and women, and he will again. The way forward in this is not by just sovereign acts. I know you can catch what I'm saying. The way forward in this is by also those who recognize what God would do. Understand the time they're living in and what must be done. And gives themselves completely to the will of God. I exist for him and no other reason. I'm not here for myself. I'm not here just because I want to live a good life. I don't want to live a good life. When I stand before him, I want to hear him say, well done. I'd like to be able to hear, wouldn't you? The Lord said there wasn't anything left undone. I was able to accomplish all that I wanted to through you. Why can't we're more meant to hear that, brothers and sisters, all of us in this room. Let that be our destiny. You agree? Put your hand on your heart for a second. Lord, let that be the destiny of God in my life. That when I stand before you, I can hear you say that. I accomplished everything in and through you that I wanted to. God, make it true. Now, secondly, I'm, I'm closing here. So how many want to be a part of an elite warrior cast? I'm not talking about elitism. I'm talking about men and women who are priestly warriors and who want to come out to God in wholeheartedness for the sake of everybody else. There's nothing to lead about that. For the sake of the Lamb, for the sake of His people, want to come out to Him. When I turn 50 years of age here, the Lord, this is where the Lord will take it if you'll let it. Here's what He said to me. He said, He came in an encounter. He said, Repeat after me. Don't you love that about Him? Didn't tell me what He's going to say. Obedience is like that. I don't need to know. I don't care. He said, repeat after me. He said, for the sake of the lamb. I said, for the sake of the lamb. He said, for the sake of his body. I said, for the sake of his body. I say yes. I said, I say yes to live as Christ and to die as gain. There is no going back for me in this. Only forward. I don't want to go back. There's only forward in this, folks, for all of us. Will God have in this day what he's after? Men and women who are completely his. They live life by the beat of an entirely other than drum. That's not of this world. They're not of this world. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, you're no longer of this world. Did that not prove to be true of them? So how many with me? 
Don't stand yet because we're about to. I want to say, Lord, I'm in it all the way. I'm in it until your end. Until your full will is accomplished. I'm not in it just for myself. I am in it for you. Am I, I'm in it for your will. I'm in it for your bride. I'm in it for your people, the church. And thus my life is yours. I will not love my life. I will love my life, not love my life unto death. I gladly offer myself to you. Joyfully offer myself to you. Oh, what a joy to suffer for him. Can you say that to him? It will be a joy to suffer for the sake of the Lamb. Now I want you to stand. As if that's in your heart, what we just prayed, I want you just to stand right where you're at. If it's not, don't stand. You don't feel pressured to stand. And I'm saying that sincerely to you because if you make this commitment, it's going to bring warfare down onto you. It, it, it will do it. Sure as the sun is going to rise tomorrow morning, warfare is going to come down on you. But so will be the refinement of God. So will be the making of a warrior. So will be the making of a priesthood. And to that, Lord, we declare yes and amen. Can you say it to him? Yes and amen. Yes to your will. Yes to your ways. Yes to your wisdom. Yes to the cross of Christ. And it's working deeply within me. We're working deeply within us. Yes to the brokenness. Yes to the scourgings. Yes, the scourgings of the Holy Spirit. That we might not grieve Him. That we might not sin against Him. We pledge ourselves in wholeheartedness and eternal commitment forever. We are yours and we come out to you. Now let's, on three, I want us to raise a shout to the Lord. Are you with me? There's no shofars, are there? Do we have any shofars, anybody? Any shofars? Yes. If y'all got shofars, let's blow them on three. We're going to shout and blow the shofars. You know, I love the shofar. Do you know the shofar is a weapon? A friend of mine, I'll tell this story real quick. A friend of mine, pastor friend of ours in Yuba City, California, got a call from a Satanist late at night. And the Satanist said this. He said, will you tell your people to quit blowing those damn horns? And so uh, Pastor Dave called Jess, he, who was up at that time of night. <laughs> he said, Jess, are y'all blowing the shofars over there? He said, we sure are, brother. <laughs> shofars are a weapon. Just thought y'all would enjoy what that Satanist had to say. I was in a meeting in Phoenix where the witch was in the back, literally in the back. She's walking around where the usher were, I don't know. She's walking around back there making all these noises, saying to the people in the back rows, he's a false prophet, don't listen to him. <laughs> She's doing all this stuff. So uh, the Lord's presence came in great power. So I had one of the guys in there to blow the shofar right in the presence of the Lord, really powerful. She takes off running out the back door, the witch does. So I like it when witches and Satanists comes into the group. They does it regularly. They do it regularly. I'm okay as long as they want to hear the word of the Lord. Now, if they want to create a problem, I'm not okay with it. Then we can do something else. <laughs> but uh, listen, folks, this is a day of war. And uh, there should be enough spiritual power of the Lord in us to attract the witches to try to come into battle with us. And if they do, we got them. You hear that? We got them. Come on to our ground. We got you. We can deal with you now. So I always welcome the witches and the Satanists because uh, I have a lot of encounters with them. And uh, that's more information than what you needed to know. But <laughs> nevertheless, it's just the truth. You know, so what we want to see 
is the word of the Lord comes that sets them free. Or at least corners them and makes them get out or the other. Uh, the prayer is they'll come to the Lord. So, so we're on three. We're going to do the shofar. And we're going to raise a shout. I'm going to ask. Let's ask for divine help in the shout. Let's ask for the angels that happen to be in the room to shout with us. You with me? Okay. One, two, three. Another thing, the Lord just told me to do this, so I'm going to do it. We need to cry this out, St. Louis for Jesus and the saints. You agree with that? Yes. We're going to shout that on three. We're going to shout, St. Louis for Jesus and the saints. One, two, three. St. Louis for Jesus and the saints. Yes, Lord. Yes, do the shofars again. Blow the shofars. Yes, Lord. Well, that'll get the fighting spirit stirred up. <laughs> Amen. All right. God bless you guys. i uh, got to say one thing, a couple of things. Uh, a young lady right here uh, talked to you a little bit last night. The book of Esther is very important for you in this season. I actually saw you dressed as Esther. You had a, a uh, precious stone that was right here in your forehead. But for such a time as this is what uh, was said directly to her by Mordecai. For such a time as this, you've been brought to the kingdom. And like Esther, to stand for the people of God and to gather the people of God and urge the people of God to get before him that the victory might be won. I'm talking about prayer. That the victory might be won. And the hand of the Lord is upon you as he was on Esther in that day, to rally the people of God to prayer. And your own life is going to be bound up with that in a very powerful way. And then the young lady who was on the worship team, is she still in here, who had this, the red hair? There, there you are. There, I don't know how I missed you. Uh, I saw this angel standing behind you this morning on the platform. He was pouring coals of fire on top of your head. And the, the Lord then pointed his sword right at your heart. And he began to show me uh, your heart for him and the heart that he was going to give you for him and the release of a depth of spiritual life in prayer and spiritual experience before him that is for this season of your life, very specifically. I ask you, Lord, to release that season to your daughter it will be the very fire of God shut up within your bones. From that is going to come a beautiful gift of prophecy. It's going to flow through you. Very powerful declarations of God are going to come out of you in this season. It's going to be rich in the presence of the Lord. Richness in the presence of the Lord on your knees. That is going to be quite addictive to your spirit and to your soul. Release that season upon your daughter now, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, God bless you. Just be seated for a quick moment. Let's open. Let's